Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers and again today I'm going to talk about a controversial subject. It's something I've been talking a lot about and toying around a lot about and today we're going to talk about a confluence of two things but uh, it starts with a, a very interesting patient I recently had and this was a guy, a male, and he said something very, very interesting to me. Uh, he had had a coronary artery bypass graft. He'd had a, um, we found blockages of his heart and um, he'd been through the cardiologist. They could stent him and he had a coronary artery bypass graft. And he said this very interesting comment to me because as part of the cardiac, they go through cardiac rehab. And I asked him about the rehab. I said, how's your cardiac rehab going? He says, I'm not doing it. Oh, come on, really? Why not? So important. He said, I don't need anyone to teach me how to eat wrong. I'm already really good at doing that. That's why I had this. And that was a comment about a cardiac rehab program. And he said to me that pretty much everybody in the cardiac rehab program is a dead man walking. Because they're not fixing, they're perseverating the exact cause of why they're in that cardiac rehab program. And I was astounded by that. It was pretty impressive. And that got me thinking a little bit about a lot of the programs that are used to treat a variety of different eating disorders. And today we're going to talk about eating disorders because this for me is the single most difficult group of folks to connect with to manage and to connect with. Because the majority of these folks with eating disorders have been through program after program after program trying to deal with the mental health stuff and trying to deal with a diet, an eating program that makes them feel awful. Makes them feel awful. So I had a patient recently, and I have a lot of patients that come to me with anorexia. I have very few that stay, and I'll, I want to put that out there because I want to throw that comment out there. That's the, that's the Achilles heel of eating disorders. But one of the things that this person had done, and I was her 20th doctor, not the first, and what they do is they doctor shop everywhere because what they have is... They discount, especially when they haven't lost all their weight or where they're binge eaters or they are bulimics, but certainly they're anorexic. They have a body dysmorphia. They do not see the physical damage. They're oblivious to it. But what they know is that they feel like crap. They're hungry all the time. They think they're eating all the time. Multiple small meals a day. Think they're eating all the time. And usually those multiple small meals are either vegetarian or they're lean animal products, but they're pathetically small, pathetically small. And by quantity in a 24 hour period, vastly inferior to what they need. But they believe they're eating multiple times a day. They're perpetually hungry for a couple of reasons. And also they have a number of GI upsets. The classic themes are constipation, Maybe some diarrhea, but constipation and bloating. Oh, I eat this, I get bloated. Or, oh, I eat this, I get constipation. Or, oh, I eat this and my fingernails swell up. Always a reason not to eat. An irritable bowel and cramping and constipation and bloating are the common symptoms that drive them down the gastroenterology pathway. So they've all had upper endoscopies. They've all had CT scans of their belly. They've all had colonoscopies, all the testing. They've all been told to eat more fiber. They've all been through some dietary program, seen dietitian after dietitian after dietitian to tell them how to eat a balanced diet. More fruits, more vegetables, more fiber. And they don't do it because it makes them feel like crap. And then they go to functional medicine doctors and the first thing they get diagnosed with is a bunch of four-letter words. So by the time these patients come in, they're full of four-letter words. Sometimes three-letter words. Not my, not my four, not the words you're going to hear on this channel, but four-letter words, acronyms. Oh, that Lyme's, I was diagnosed with Lyme's disease. 
I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS they call it. I have a collagen, a connective tissue disorder. But the big ones, the current big ones, SIBO. What is SIBO? Oh, well, it, 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 bacterial overgrowth. SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which for most people is an impossible condition. It doesn't exist. Or SIRS, some sort of chronic inflammatory reaction that they never knew they had. But what happens is they go through all this testing and all the tests come back positive. And then here's the treatment for the disease you don't have. And they spend literally tens of thousands of dollars on a whole bunch of testing and treatment and esoteric tests. I understand why they get, have these tests, but they have no bearing to what their condition is because they've got cramping and irritable bowel and constipation and bloating. And it reinforces the fact that if you don't eat, you feel better. So the, and I got this from this, they'd been to a SIBO doctor and they were recommending all these powders and potions. And the question I got, having seen this patient as the 20th or the 30th or the 40th or the 100th doctor they're seeing, how would you treat it? How would you treat my SIBO? They're absolutely certain they got SIRS and SIBO. How would you treat it? Why do you say it's not possible to have SIBO? They've given me all this stuff. What should I do? Should I take it? I've already paid for it. And I said, Look, it's not possible for you to have SIBO. It's not possible. All of the tests will come back positive and they will give you some concoction to treat, but it's all a massive distraction from the plan you should be on, you should embark on to get better. And you know, what's interesting folks is I have a lot of experience with this, not just from the SIBO side, but the commonest problem that we have is the statin side. Because when people diagnose SIBO and they come up with a treatment for it, it's exactly the same as the conventional doctors that prescribe statins. What do they do? They look at the cholesterol numbers. They do a test called cholesterol, which has no bearing to anything, as you've probably heard in the space and certainly on this channel. And then they scare the crap out of you with a test that they've read as being positive. And then they prescribe medication that's got a bunch of side effects that does not fix the problem because the test does not measure the harm. You know, folks, I've created a weekly cycle for myself where I have no calorie Mondays. I go from dinner Sunday night to dinner Tuesday night, 48 hours of no calories. And the purpose is to get into ketosis to restore my metabolic health. In order to get there quickly, on the early Monday morning, I will always go for a run, exercise. And the purpose there is to burn sugar off my liver. And as soon as I'm done with my run, I do a shot of Ketone IQ. This is a ketone uh, product that gets rapidly absorbed and transitions me very quickly into ketosis. Once the Ketone IQ is burnt off, I'm going to be using my own fat for the rest of that day. So I get into uh, nutritional ketosis much, much quicker, much deeper when I do that. And that has advantages and allows me to do a 48 hour fast and not have to do even more extended fasts. Try it, do the experiment. If it works, use it. If it doesn't work, don't use it, but help yourself. Cholesterol and LDL does not measure your risk of cardiovascular disease, period. So to put you on a statin because your cholesterol and your, uh, and your LDL are abnormal, and then to think that you're gonna protect yourself from cardiovascular risk because you're on a statin is bullshit. But they scare the crap out of you. They're emotive about it. Exactly the same thing with the SIRS people, CIRS, and the SIBO people. I had a patient the other day tell me, oh, they found mold in my basement. I didn't even know I had it there. Mold. Mold. There's another four-letter word. M-O-L-D. Mold. SIRS. SIBO. Limes. IBS. All of these acronyms. EDS. Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Come on, folks. Once that person comes in, they've got a collective set of names and they're calling it by the acronym without even explaining it. You know they're down that rabbit hole. So, the way I explain SIBO is this SIBO in an anorexic, SIBO in an eating disorders person. Weeds grow over a disused highway. If you look at a highway that hasn't been used, hasn't had cars driven on it, or a railway 
a railroad that hasn't had trains go on it. The weeds grow up. And if you cut the weeds down, they just grow back. Only traffic gets rid of the weeds and keeps them gone. Same with your gut. The issue is the absence of traffic and the absence of the type of cars on the road, not the overgrowth. There is no treatment for SIBO that involves pills and potions and powders. The treatment is eating. The treatment is food. And you can knock me out the park. You go, I went to my doctor and they did all the... And yet, at the same time, when, you, when you're calling me out about SIBO, you're yelling at the people prescribing statins. Okay? So let's talk, about, let's talk about some of the eating disorders. Let's talk about anorexia. How do we understand that anorexic? And it was funny. Uh, um, my wife um, recently had an interaction with somebody. And she came back and she told me the story. And as she began, I mean, she was three or four sentences. I said, that person's got an anorexic eating disorder. Oh, no, they don't. Oh, they've got all this GI stuff. And oh, they get. And my wife had completely bought into their story, hook, line, and sinker. And that's what the SIBO proponents do. They buy into the functional story of your gut without thinking about the big picture. They take on your perception and become a victim of your perception of your disease. They do not offer you an independent perspective on what's really going on. But within three or four sentences, I knew exactly what was going on with that person that my mother, that my wife met. She had an eating disorder, anorexia. And when you interact with them, they're oblivious to it for the most part. Or at least they see it, they see, it's like looking at the sun through clouds. They see it from time to time, but usually things become very cloudy again. And it's very, very difficult to connect because anorexia is not an eating disorder. It's not a calorie issue. And most of all, for those people, oh, I work in the anorexia space. It is not a control disorder. It is not a control issue. It's an anxiety issue. It's a petrified fear issue. That something bad is going to happen, that people are going to think badly. It is a paralyzingly anxiety issue. And the way that we treat that anxiety is to try to control everything. But the root cause is profound anxiety, depression, and emotional distress. And that has to be dealt with. And the control emanates out of complete distrust of everything and everybody that they're going to trigger that anxiety and they don't want to feel that angst. That's what results in an eating disorder, folks. It's not a control issue. And the methods they use is to be, to have a blunt affect, to not allow themselves emotionality. They intellectualize everything. Everything is about thoughts and the word feelings don't come in. Because they're afraid to feel. They're afraid to feel. And every little feeling that is slightly abnormal gets blown up. Oh, I've got SIBO. I've got, I've got bloating. I've got... Because they're afraid something bad's going to happen if they let some little untoward feeling go off. And I understand that it's not a fault thing or a blame thing. But you've got to see it in order to help them. You've got to have that perspective of their perception and help them to change it. They may look very fit, skinny but fit, but you look at their face, the facial muscular structure is gone. They may even have a little pooch of fat because they're insulin resistant even though they're not eating. They're insulin resistant even though they're not eating. They all have insulin resistance that's measurable. Huh? I don't need I have insulin resistance. Yes. Yes. Insulin resistance is the metabolic dysfunction of anorexia as much as it is the metabolic dysfunction of obesity. And most people don't understand that. Because what an anorexic is most afraid of is being fat. And of course, eating fat causes fat. So there's no way on God's earth they're going to eat fat. They're going to be glucose dominant to the point of insulin resistance, to the point that because they're not eating enough, their, their, 
biology, their energy-driven biology, is scavenging their own muscles, their own muscles for energy. And they can't tap into their fat because their insulin levels are high and that's protecting them from using the little pooch in their belly. So they're bloated all the time because they've got this layer of fat in their belly and around their organs. They have no skeletal muscle, but you, you, you put a scope in their belly, a laparoscope in their belly, and you'll see fat. Fat around their organs, fat in their organs, a mental fat. Why? Because they're hyperinsulinemic. They are insulin resistant and they're not eating fat. And fat, eating fat is the antidote. But one of the ways to communicate with the anorexics is to say, look, I'm an obesity doctor. I treat fat people. What method do I use to get fat people to lose weight? I put them on a ketogenic diet. I get them to eat massive amounts of fat. I get them to eat fat so that they will lose weight. Same is true for you. And it's absolutely true because if we correct insulin resistance, their obesity goes away. That perpetual sign of sense of anxiety, that adre adrenaline perpetuation goes away. And adrenaline dives insulin resistance. Ask Ben Beckman. On top of that, they typically will have a low BMI under 18, but not always. They may be having a BMI of 20, 21, 22, but they're petrified of gaining weight. They have a fat eating phobia. They're afraid of eating fat, but they will eat lean protein. They'll eat vegetables and salads and they will exercise like crazy. Well, what does exercise do? It drives adrenaline. So their fix is adrenaline. Their fix is insulin resistance. And they're exercising like crazy. And they will roadblock everything you have to say. So intellectually, they're afraid of everything that involves change. They don't see how they are and they are afraid of change. So they will, in a kind but very cold way, in a very objective way, roadblock every suggestion. And when you get too close to them, when you get too close, because they're afraid of people, actually they're afraid of themselves interacting with people, they run away. And that's why I diagnose it a lot and I don't keep those patients because too often they run away. They're not ready for that help yet. And I'll never lock somebody down. That is, that is dehumanizing to lock somebody down, to tell someone, leave the bathroom door open so we can see you're not purging. That is so dehumanizing. I will never do that. I want to help you to help yourself. But roadblocking is an issue. And the excessive focus on GI issues, on the bloating, on the, oh, laxatives through the, oh, but I just, I use enemas, I use laxatives. Whenever I eat this, I get bloated. Laxative use is pervasive because they're afraid of the bloating. And constipation is ubiquitous. What's constipation? I don't poop out every five days. And then it's a hard little nugget. Well, that's not constipation. That's not eating. You've got to help them to understand that. You can't poke them in the eye with that. SIBO, EDS, Lyme, SIRS, mold. Didn't even know I had it, but I spent $10,000 on treating it. Tore down my house. I'm, we live in Florida, folks. I just got a lung full of mold. The amount of money they spend on tests and treatments through the roof, through the roof. They've all spent tens of thousands of dollars on treatments and diagnostic tests and charlatan doctors that take them at their word about their symptoms. The obstructionism, the roadblocking isolates them because as soon as you give them advice, they run away. Sometimes they'll engage. So if you don't build trust, you don't have to tell them all the stuff right away. If you don't build trust, if you don't have that connection, then their perception will fight your perspective on what the truth is. And we have to help them to slowly let go of their perception that this is a gut issue, that this is a GI issue that somebody just hasn't found, that they need a better or a different doctor to find the problem, and slowly change their perspective that the problem is a lack of traffic through the gut rather than traffic through the gut. But we have to build trust. We have to unmask their depression, unmask their anxiety, be aware of that anxiety because it's fragile. And a fragile 
wild animal will run away if it can. Yes, we treat anorexia. Myself, our dietitian, our mental health counselor, we have a psychi psychiatric nurse practitioner. But it, our titles don't matter. What matters is our diagnostic perspective and our ability to build trust. Am I good at that? Mm -mm. No, nope, I'm not. I'm better than most, but nobody's good at it. But ultimately, eating disorders are a trust issue, an anxiety issue. Trust of themselves, trust of those around them. And that is such, such a difficult thing to overcome. But eating disorders are anxiety disorders of a lack of traffic, or reverse traffic, binge eating disorder, purging. Hmm. Perception versus perspective and how to turn around and how to help someone to control their own narrative. That's the psychology of eating disorders. And we try. But, 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 the danger with anorexia in particular is refeeding. Karen Carpenter, more people die during, more anorexics die during refeeding than the starvation phase because potassium goes through the roof, they get cardiovascular effects, and it's very, very dangerous. The healthiest thing that an anorexic can eat to start with is to slowly increase the fat percentage in their diet. Fat suppresses appetite. So they, you get rid of that perpetual hunger, that gnawing hunger. Fat feeds the gut. Fat feeds the body. Fat protects the protein they're eating so it goes toward their muscles. So it goes toward their neurotransmitters and function. The amino acids, and a lot of the neurotransmitters are amino acids. Fat fixes anorexia. A ketogenic diet is the single most effective nutritional therapy for anorexia. And the more carnivore they can be, the better. So a high-fat carnivore diet, small amounts, jam-packed with energy, and they won't get fat. They won't get fat. And then along with that can come some micronutrients. They won't eat the yolk because it's got too much cholesterol and fat. They'll eat the egg white. Well, let's get you to eat the yolk as well. Let's get you to eat a little high-fat hamburger, just a few spoonfuls. Let's get you to eat a little bit of salmon. Let's get you to put a little butter or olive oil on that food. Oh, but it's fat, it's fat. Trust me. Let's work on this. Scale won't budge. The scale will stay fairly level when you eat fat, but you'll start feeling better. And as long as you walk through the door, we'll work with you. It's tough. It's tough. But we want more sunshine and less clouds. We want to be able to see yourself. And the greatest danger, and we see this with anorexics all the time, is they flip to the other side of the coin and they all gain massive amounts of weight. So what their fear is is absolutely true, that they will become obese and they will become fat because they trade in not eating for carbohydrates as a variant transfer of managing anxiety. And they go from not eating to manage anxiety to carbohydrates to manage anxiety. They change their addiction and we cannot let that happen. And the best way to not let that happen is to eat fat to get them on a ketogenic diet. And they will learn to trust that they can eat and not be fat. That's what we're looking for. I am the carb addiction doc. That was a tough one, but I'm passionate about it. And if you can help me to be able to find methods of building trust. That's really what's missing. Once we're on a path and the trust is being built, it's good. But too many anorexics run away because of a fear of trust. I am the carb addiction doc. If you need help, if you want to learn, if you want to place a bit of trust in us and you don't want to spend a lot of money, give us a shout. 561-517-0642. We've got a team of people that care. But think it through. Listen to this video a few times. And know what our program involves. 
There's a mental health component, there's a nutritional component. But a nutritional component that won't make you fat. That's the beauty about it. If you like our content, if you have thought differently, throw us a dollar. It goes to a charitable fund to support this, to our Patreon account or to our um, uh, PayPal account. I prefer the PayPal account. It's just simpler and easier. Till next time.